our sights on what used to be the border between Buckinghamshire and Northamptonshire near Milton Keynes. Excavations by students at an archaeological field school revealed the building within the smaller crop mark circle. Pat and Jonathan, who run the school, are pretty confident about what they've uncovered. So after all your hard work, what have you got here? Well, we have a 12th century building, some 11 metres long by 5 metres wide, three equal bays inside. We have the suggestion of a staircase. This is here? Yes, that's Which way is it going then? And it's going straight up to the side of the building. I see. What do you think it might be? Well, the presence of the staircase indicates it could be a first floor hall. Other possibilities are a hunting lodge or possibly part of a monastic grange. It's intriguing, isn't it, Mick? Yeah. And we've got our Jonathan here to try yeah. and decode <laughs> what the building might be. I'll stick my oar in here. Yeah. I know it's a meaty site, this one. I want to get my teeth into it. And indeed, if this is a first floor chamber at the end of a hall, then we should, we should be standing in the, in the top bar of a capital T-shaped plan with a hall going off that way. If it's right, it'll be a big discovery. But I must say, from what I see, it looks a bit more like cow shed than two-storey <laughs> block. So I really want to get in there and have a look. Because it's a few years since this trench was dug, we've got to re-excavate the building, check the measurements, and see if we agree with Pat and Jonathan's conclusions. If it was originally a two-storey building, it would probably have been a manor house with a high-status tea block where the Lord lived and ran a large estate. The best alternative is that it could have been a hunting lodge. While we get to grips with the building in the small enclosure, Geophys are looking for the larger enclosure further down the field. The crop marks aren't visible now, so they've got to cover a big area. To speed things up, they're using their quickest technique, magnetometry, looking for telltale magnetic variations which can indicate burnt material in a ditch or around a half, for example. The previous excavation produced an absolute mound of pottery. Paul Blinkhorn's already identified where it was made and dated it. It seems that the building was occupied for a surprisingly short time. So now, is the character of this wall the same as that opposite one there? No, it's not. This wall is far more crumbly than this one, but there are traces of mortar in it. Well, that's interesting, because if this is a big chamber block, I'd expect it to be built at the same time and for them to be linked. So I want to see the end walls, what we have of them, and to uncover this. I really want to see this wall. The wall's been reburied since the excavation, so we just have to dig it up again. Ah, no, that's better, look. Let's have a look at the width, because that one is skinny for me. It's skinny and it's badly built, and I wouldn't want to live at the first floor of a house that's been built like that. So what did you say your internal measurement was? It was about 375. 375. Come on, Jonathan, get that tape out. Oh, the runners there. Well, if that goes from there to there, well, then we might be in business. We might be in business indeed. This wall may just be the right size for a two-storey building. But just as the archaeology is looking more promising, Stuart's piling on the pressure with a whole new set of questions. Do we have any evidence that there was a manor here on the ground? I don't think we do at the moment. What it looks like is if we've got a building set within an earlier enclosure of another period. Right. What we've got is a whole load oh, of these things. loads yeah. of them, yeah. This is the enclosure there. These look very typically prehistoric in date to me. In the pattern of fields and boundaries here, I've not seen anything which gives me any suggestion as a manorial site. I mean, there should be a church or a chapel, there should be other buildings, there should be road layouts. There's a building on its own at the moment. That's very much what it looks like. We've also got an overlapping problem that we've got royal hunting forest in this area. So could what we have be a hunting lodge? It's possible it could be something like a bailiff's lodge, something like that, an estate manager. It, it, at the moment, it could almost be anything, but it doesn't look like it's a manorial site to me. And as the excavation uncovers more of the walls, it now seems less and less like a manor house to Phil and Jonathan as well. If we ain't got a, a wall that's four foot wide and it ain't four foot deep, what's that tell us about our building? Well, it looks more like it's going to be uh, a ground floor one. But, Pat, you've got a staircase. It was only ever the possibility that it was a staircase. I'm willing to sort of forgo with that idea. I mean, it looks like it might be actually a lower status dwelling. Well, we've got to try and fit in where actually the high status stonework comes yeah, from. Yeah, that's true. It's all to play for, isn't it? It still is. Look, that's where we did the initial strip, and it just was so weak we couldn't see it. But there's the circuit. Well, that's Follow quite clear. Follow all the way around. We've got problems with that 
pylon, the electricity. Right. Right. But if you want to put a trench across the ditch, we can mark one for you easily. With these two trenches, we should be able to date the ditches and see if there's any other sign of medieval life inside this larger enclosure. Well, I think there's still a lot to do here. You talk about this being a peasant's hovel, but, I mean, it, it's really... It looks like a medieval longhouse that belonged to, you know, a villain, a, a, a peasant farmer. The thing is, they don't occur on their own. You know, it'd be very odd to have one stuck out here in the countryside. They usually come in this part of the world as part of a settlement. And what about all these strange enclosures surrounding it? When, when you see them plotted out across the landscape, as Stuart's done, it looks like an Iron Age landscape underneath this, this uh, medieval one. It would be very unusual to get circular oval enclosures in, in, in the medieval period. They're nearly all rectangular, square and so on. And, of course, what we need to sort out there is to date those. Anything else? We still don't know the context of this. If this is 12th, 13th century, it'll appear in the documents somewhere. Stuart and Dawn did have some success looking through the documentary records in Aylesbury. Just to show you what we've got, this area in pink is, is the manner of, of hand slope in here, with our site right at the top, the top corner. Right. Now, what we've been able to establish is that the site itself actually is within the Royal Forest area of... Salsi. This is all part of the forest yeah. and therefore our site will be subject to forest jurisdiction as it were. Now the evidence for that is that we've got names like Hanslope Green, which we've been able to identify, mentioned as being within the forest. Right. Salsi Green as being within the forest. Well, that's right and I undertook some research into the subtenancies of Hanslope Manor. Yeah. I came across a family name of Bosenham. Now they ah. seem to have taken ah yeah they <laughs> seem to have taken their name from this northern part of the parish. Just across the parish boundary is Bosenham Mill. Yeah, we we, we cross that. Yeah, that's as we right. Come that, in, that's don't that's we? right. Yeah. But yeah. I think that that name applies to a bigger area. Bosenham literally means Bosa spur of land. Mm. Now the mill is not on a spur of land. Mm. Our site is, is on a spur yeah, of land, yeah. so, so I think we've got a real clue there. So, so, so that seems might be the name of the site that we're doing then? I think it might well be. Ah, well, that, oh, that's brilliant, isn't it, to have a name to attach to it? <laughs> so we know that our site, Bosnum, was in the forest in the 12th century. And we also know from the Doomsday Book that this was quite a wealthy area, with, amongst other things, a predominance of pigs. Hanslope boasts a thousand pigs, compared to the handful its neighbours had. But keeping pigs in and around the royal forest had its risks. This was part of a huge patchwork of hunting grounds created by William the Conqueror, which spread across the country. Not even the barons could hunt or farm there without royal permission, and peasants would get in serious trouble. It looks like we've got a hearth or, or small oven and, or kiln there, right. right at the edge of the trench, and possibly another collapsed one here. But of course, we've only got this kind of two metre wide slot going across here. So and have you got any really. pottery from it? Um, more of the same pottery coming out here, it's all medieval, similar to the stuff coming out of the ditch. And Paul's worked out that there are two concentrations of pottery. Usually, big deposits of broken pot are found in so called middens or rubbish pits. Two middens could mean two houses. What we've got is this massive spread of pottery and domestic refuse right up against the wall of the building. Just we'd expect to find a domestic midden. Now, now suppose, I mean, one of the things we were deliberating about yesterday about was, was where there might have been a doorway. I'd say from this, there must have been a doorway in this wall. Nearly always the midden's near a door. <laughs> you just go out and <laughs> chuck, it out and chuck it out. Yeah, that's I like that, did, I like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, day one, I said it's a meaty site, OK? Yeah. Now, the theory is this. No one actually lived here. It's a pig processing plant. Right. Come now. on, justify this. <laughs> oh, OK. Given oh. the rubble that you've got in front of you. <laughs> it's, it's very small for a house, OK? Yeah. It could still be, you know, peasants, um, um, small hovel or something. But I'm suggesting pigs are brought in, possibly water heated, scald the pigs, you know, and dehair them. And then maybe this is some kind of a smokehouse. Those weird metal um, clamps we found might just be for pigs' legs. Now. When you told me this, I thought it was brilliant. You're the professional, how does it well, feel to you? The, well, the, the thing that helps, I think, is that in Doomsday Book, for this particular manor, they record a thousand pigs on the manor. 
you know, using the woods for grazing and so around it. That's a hell of a lot of pigs to have around. And what's this doing here, which is the only hearth we've found in the entire place. It's not in the middle, as you might expect, but it's slightly outside the building. Do you buy the idea of it leaking its smoke this way into the house? Well, you feel where the wind's coming from now. Over there, it's without any doubt. behind yeah. us. So, yeah. prevailing yeah. winds from the southwest, you put this at the southwest corner, it's going to blow the smoke into the building, isn't it? Yeah. So, it's in the right place. It's all pretty plausible, isn't it? Here, we've got lots of blobs on the, the geophysics. And so we've opened this area. This is where Matt was working in a, a narrow trench over there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. But now we're getting all sorts of burnt areas, bits of pottery 12th century, stuff like that. So it, it's sort of looking like occupation, I think. So much interesting stuff coming up. There but is, we yeah. Can't yeah. interpret it yet. What's this thing here, Bridge? Well, you can see it, Tony. That's a very circular-looking structure. It's got these great pitch stones all the way around the outside of it. All the stones really heat-affected. It's surrounded by a lot of burning, discrete areas of charcoal, so it's definitely looking something like a, a hearth. We started out with just one building, but it's now becoming clear that Bosnum was a busy place. Pot and bone from the circular ditch show that people were also living down here in the 12th century at exactly the same time as the building was occupied. I can see that there are all of the main domesticates. Uh, here we are, cattle jaws, sheep jaws, uh, pig also, and there's even a bit of horse here. Inside the big enclosure, they've uncovered a medieval workplace. Good job, Matt. What have we got? Well, we've got a large post hole there. Another enormous one here. So presumably they were posts supporting a big roofed building? Yeah, huge. I mean, these are really substantial. Yeah. And it still had the remains of a scorched post in it as well. Got another shallow post hole there, another one with packing stones there, so we may have even an internal wall going up that way. And what's that? Well, this to me looks like a small collapsed oven or kiln of some sort, vaguely circular, you can see it there. Over here, got a much better example of what I think that probably looked like. Beautiful circular oven or something there, still in quite a good nick. And over here, we have another one. This one's slightly more collapsed, but we can see the base of it is all scorched and burnt. And going round this, this area here is this ditch, which comes along here, round here, and goes off to the corner of the trench over there. Lots of finds. Yeah, a huge amount of really beautiful finds here. I mean, look at that, that jug handle. That's gorgeous. gorgeous. There's a heck of a lot of activity going mm. on here. This settlement of pig farmers at Bosnum has given us an unfamiliar glimpse of ordinary life in the medieval manor of Hanslope. Powerful nobles, such as the Mordwits, grabbed the headlines of history by quarrelling with the king. But the story of Bosnum is really the history of ordinary people. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. The village of Islip near Oxford has got a claim to fame. It's said that the great Saxon king Edward the Confessor was born somewhere round here. And the local villagers want to celebrate the millennium anniversary of his birth. So they've asked us whether we can find the 13th century chapel that was built in his honour. Not only that, but they want us to find the Saxon palace where he was born, which seems to me a pretty tall order. Except the fact is, nobody has ever dug here before, and we've got just three days to try and sort it all out. The village of Islip is about six miles northeast of Oxford, and these days it's home to some 600 people who'd love to find some actual evidence in the ground to prove their link with Edward the Confessor. I don't know about you, but I always get really confused by all the English Saxon kings and their elaborate names, so I'm very pleased to see this bloke, Sam. Morning, Tony. What are the dates of Edward the Confessor? 1042 to January the 5th, 1066. And what's he famous for? He's famous for keeping the country safe for a generation and for the great building project at Westminster Abbey. But on the downside, big succession crisis because no children. So then you get King Harold, Harold yeah. arrow through the eye, and William the Conqueror. That's right, and Battle of Hastings. Why is he called the Confessor? Uh, it's a name given to him long after his death, once he became regarded as a saint. A Confessor is like a priest, a monk. This is very quick history, this, isn't it? So, to begin with, we're going to have a go at finding this medieval stone chapel built in honour of Edward the Confessor. And this illustration by antiquarian Thomas Hearn is the only clue we have 
to what it actually looked like. Helpfully, Hearn tells us that it was situated to the north of the church, which probably means that it's now buried under one of these gardens. But the villagers reckon it's going to be easy to work out where it was. Stuart, on the face of it, this looks extremely simple because I've just spotted sight of King's Chapel <laughs> and a big cross. So <laughs> what's the problem? It does look pretty obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> now, the problem with these crosses, when the map makers were coming round in, in the late 18th century, they, they were soldiers. Mm -hmm. They'd speak to the local vicar or local antiquarian and he might have said, ah, there was a palace over there or there was a moat over there or there was a, a chapel over there. And it wasn't that important to it, them. No, it wasn't. So... so that could be one of two things. It could be somebody precisely knew where that was and that is bang on. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, it could be just, oh, it was, it was over in that yard somewhere and the surveyor just put the cross there. Tricky. Stuart's worked out where the cross would be on the modern map. And it falls firmly Ooh. in the middle of that timber yard. Well, this is a surprise. No resistance from Geofiz. Let's hope it's all worth it, because, of course, we can't trust the big X on the map. It's quite possible that the remains of the chapel could be in the pub car park. Or in the garden of the house next door. There's no room for Geofiz to survey in this garden, so we've decided to open up a few random test pits. Speed things up. But there's still a very good reason for digging here in the garden of Confessor's Gate, and that is the house deeds include a plan that marks the site of the King's Chapel. That yeah. little square there is where the map maker shows us the chapel. It's yeah. tiny. Yeah. And it's the wrong direction. It, well, it, but on the other hand, if that's the if that's the east end of it, yeah, it would be over there somewhere where the blue sheet is. It would mean it would be coming back this way. I'd be incredibly happy, wouldn't it, if that, that would, were that'd right? Be better, wouldn't it? And it extends underneath our feet so with something up to that sort of size. Yeah. So we're going to extend one of our test pits in this garden to cover that possibility, even if one of the oh, residents dude. has other ideas. <laughs> Damn thing! <laughs> Got it! <laughs> so, with a trench in this garden and one in the timber yard, which has just got going again, we've got two possible sites for our chapel. History doesn't get any bigger than this, and I'm still hopeful we might stumble on the Saxon palace where Edward was born. Edward's failure to produce an heir may have resulted in the Battle of Hastings in 1066, but he was also responsible for the building of Westminster Abbey. As I understand it, Edward left the manor of Islip to the monastery before he died. Westminster then built the chapel in Islip in honour of Edward some years later. The chapel was built more than 150 years after Edward's death, which would put it in the reign of Henry III. This would make sense, as Henry was obsessed with the memory of Edward the Confessor, who'd been made a saint in 1161. Henry rebuilt Edward's Abbey at Westminster and may have been responsible for building the chapel in Islip. He was keen to popularise the figure of Saint Edward and encourage the cult following for him that was growing in the 13th century. The cult of Saint Edward is one that had been growing through the reigns of previous kings. Flowers, really flowers, in Henry III's time. And what, we, what, what it seems to represent is a way of those Norman and Plantagenet kings giving legitimacy to their rule over the English, at the same time as, uh, for the English themselves, Edward being the last of the legitimate old English kings, it thus represents a kind of reconciliation focus for the French and the English. So it's as though the Normans are saying, it's all right, Saxons, because uh, we're related to Edward the Confessor, who you like. Exactly, exactly. It was your born in uh, the little dwelling in which I was born, be naman yit slepper by the name of Islip. There, there's no point in making that up, really, it, especially because people in the early 12th century might have known that he, he, if he'd been born somewhere else, they might have known that. As if we could ever have doubted it, Edward was born in Islip. And believe it or not, just now in the Garden of Confessor's Gate, we've made a remarkable discovery celebrating that very fact. Now, a bit of glass. isn't this <laughs> just what Every archaeologist in the world wow. would like to see if they're digging a historical <laughs> character. Fesser. Fantastic. What do you think that is? Let's see. It looks like it's early Victorian or some, something 
of that period, the early 19th century. Geophys are only too pleased to escape the problems of small back gardens, and they've already surveyed a small area of this open field. And the first trench will go in here. Believe the geophysics. <laughs> you, you didn't tell me that it was specifically a war. You said there was a large anomaly there. But what we have here is a chance to investigate a forgotten medieval manor house that's very much part of the story of Westminster Abbey and medieval Islip. As you come along here, the most important thing is we've actually got part of the wall that runs around the, the outskirts of the, of the manor. You see, we've got one edge there, that's the inside edge. And then on the outside edge here, so we've got the wall running parallel with the moat, and then on the outside again, we've got a lot of clay, which I think is part of the bank, which is stacked up against the wall. But the thing we've discovered now is, this is where we've put the trench over these anomalies here. Now we've extended the survey across the field. Look at these responses. Cool. <laughs> the main building is about 30 metres over there. Right, so this trench must be important if Jonathan's got his hands dirty. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll dig for my supper. And you've done an extension. Uh, here, yes. Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> Could it be the chapel? Do you know, I think it can. And the reason I say that is because it's roughly where Stuart had mapped it. We've got a wall coming down here. It's cut into this see the shade of mucus there in the clay. Um, that would be the outside of it. That's the inside. The wall thickness is about right. If that's a north wall, this is the west one, then we're looking for a door just the other side of the garden wall. So it could be this corner here, look. Northwest corner like that. Yeah. Raksha, who's queen of the dig? <laughs> <laughs> Me! <laughs> <laughs> How did she do it? Well, she went below what we'd previously thought was undisturbed natural earth and got the wall below it. So today, this is what we think is the natural here, but we're going to get our archaeologists to go below that to see if we've got anything medieval too. The theory is we've discovered the northwest corner of the chapel in this garden and it's possibly the only bit that survives, as we've dug other trenches close by and found nothing. We can't open any more trenches, which is why we thought it was worth digging deeper here, just to see if we get any related finds. We decided to dig here because an old map had this field marked as the site of Ethelred's palace, where Edward the Confessor was born a thousand years ago. But we've now proved that the only important building remains in this field belong to the medieval manor. Yesterday, Geophys revealed this plot showing the extent of it, and today we're opening up trenches here, over what we think is the manor house itself, a building that must have been one of the biggest and grandest houses in the area. We know it must have been quite special because Isabella, Edward II's queen, stays here. Right. And so it's certainly fit for a, a royal residence. Um, but you see, that's interesting, because we, we, I think we've been rather assuming that it's a, a fairly big, sort of extensive complex, but, but, but it may not be from the implication of what well, you're Well, it saying. isn't really. I mean, in Doomsday, no? but look, if you look at Doomsday, it's quite small. It still seems most likely that the Saxon settlement was on top of the hill. But it could be that Islip was an even smaller place than Victor's drawn here. Phil? Yo! Nice bit of wall in it. Absolutely magnificent, isn't it? I mean, look at the size of it. And the beautiful thing of it is that we can actually tell that where Ian is is outside the building. You can see that it's just dirt and soil. And where I'm standing is inside the building. So we would expect to find the other wall somewhere there, just inside the moat. Can you definitely say that that's medieval? Yes, I can, because all the pottery above it is medieval. There's nothing, there's nothing earlier or nothing later. It's, so it's sealed by medieval pottery. And more importantly, it's got a superb assemblage of roof tile. Yeah, they call these coxcombs with the sort of the jagged top. You know, it's, it's well, because they look like a coxcomb, I suppose. Paul's not easily impressed, but it's unusual to get so many finds of such quality. Personally, I'm intrigued by this bit of medieval glass. And that is a urinal. 
Are you rhino? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty exciting. Do you eh? mean like a potty, a long potty? <laughs> well, they were they were used for medicinal purposes. Um, in the medieval period, the urine was a key to recognising the symptoms of lots of diseases by the by the uh, the medical practitioners at the time. So you'd have these glass vessels for you'd put the urine in, hold it up to the light, and they'd make their pronouncements. Make sure you wash your hands before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> It's been so much easier digging in this field as opposed to up on the hill, where we can only put in small trenches. But no one can accuse us of not trying hard enough. Today, here in the garden of Confessor's Gate, we've been digging deeper just to make sure we haven't missed any evidence relating to the medieval chapel we found next door. Well, yesterday I was giving your wife a really hard time because it seemed that your garden wasn't riddled with history in the way that you both hoped it would be. <laughs> but this morning we had a reassessment. We realised that actually we hadn't gone down as far in these trenches as we needed to go. So Matt spent virtually the whole day re-excavating these <laughs> trenches and the news is I was right, there is no history <laughs> in your garden. There's nothing here at all. Nothing here at all. As you can see, oh, look at that. It's a lovely great hole. Big, great big hole. Yes. But the good news is that it looks as though next door we've got the chapel. So great. the value yeah. of their house is going to rock it now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll solve them the name. As ever, back garden archaeology is a tricky business, and there's no predicting how it will turn out. Raksha, how's our chapel getting on? really a chapel anymore. <laughs> You're kidding. No, it's a more humble building. It's a privy. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> no. So you've got a cesspit, in fact. Yes. Why? How do you know? <laughs> Found lots of a de degraded faeces, I'm afraid. There There's you go. There's a of it down there. Though. And what's this thing here? It's a nice uh, kind of cauldron vessel cooking pot that we found. And you found bottom. it down the toilet? Yes. I can't imagine what it was doing down there. <laughs> what, what date is the cesspit? The cesspit is about 17th century. I can't believe it. Yesterday we were convinced we had a medieval chapel here. What happened? Raksha, as queen of the trenches, <laughs> how could you mistake a medieval chapel for a 17th century toilet. Well, it just shows it's an easy mistake to make. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the right vicinity. Oh, yeah, there's probably, no doubt we're, we're, in, the right, we're yeah. in the right patch for it, yeah. But just can't see it in any of the, the sections we've yeah. got. So it's not here. What a way to end a dig. I don't think I've ever felt so disappointed. What really hacks me off is that I'd assumed that at the end of the programme I would be standing here surrounded by one of those fantastic time team graphics of the chapel with those great walls shooting up in the air and that huge roof and those very interesting windows and instead I guess you'll have to make do with a drawing of some old bloke sitting on a 17th century loo. Time team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Take a look at this photo taken in Port Skewit, South Wales. This is Harold's Field. It's dotted with mysterious lumps and bumps and I reckon it's going to be a real cracker of a site. Picture the scene. It's 1065, the year before the Battle of Hastings, and Harold Godwinson, soon to be king, is riding up this slope looking for a site for his brand new hunting lodge fit to entertain royalty. Why here? Well, it's always been strategically important. It's on the main crossing point for anyone wanting to go from England through to Wales. The Romans built here, the Welsh had a royal palace here, but amazingly, no one's ever dug here. Up till now. Time Team have got just three days to find out what really is under Harold's Field. Most of us know King Harold as a loser, the Saxon king killed by an arrow in the eye at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. But what many people won't know is that he was actually a very successful warrior in the years before he became king. As Earl of Wessex, he owned land that bordered Wales, and personally, as a big fan of Harold, I'm looking forward to finding out what he was doing here in Port Skewit. 
The reason why no one's ever dug here at Harold's Field before is that way back in 1928, it was deemed so historically important that they made it a scheduled ancient monument, which means nobody's allowed to excavate it. But this is Kate Smith, who lives locally, don't I you? I do. I live over the road in Subbrook. And Kate organised this petition. Would you like to see a professional excavation at Harold's Field? That was very enterprising of you. Why did you do that? Well, because nobody knows for certain what's under the, under the field. And and uh, we have a lot of very curious villagers who would love to know. The world's ba band together and we have a great big gang that come and, and kill the builders and seize all the goods that are assembled here by Harold for hunting and building. So we're not even dealing with a complete building, it appears. So the Welsh burnt down Harold, the Englishman's holiday home? Uh, yes. <laughs> There's a bit of a pattern there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> But for the archaeologists, this dig is about more than just looking for Saxon evidence. This ridge of higher ground was on the main route for anyone crossing the River Severn. And there are clues to suggest that this field was occupied over many centuries. Local pottery expert Steve Clark has dug several trenches in the area and found Iron Age, Roman and medieval finds all around the edges of Harold's Field. When you say you've got medieval pottery from here, what sort of date is that in the Well, it's, it's a job to say. It's, it's probably 13th century. It could be 14th, but there's, it's not really closely datable because there's not enough of it. So it's, not Harold yet, then? No Saxon pottery. There's, there's, no, there's one shirt from southern Wales. So if we got something Saxon, that would We'd be a big story. It, yeah. Yes, it would yeah. be really big. Key to understanding this site will be making sense of the lumps and bumps. Geophys are busy trying to detect what lies beneath them, while Henry is collecting data to make a 3D model. And Stuart seems to be studying them from every angle. He hasn't spotted anything Saxon yet, but he reckons he can see traces of something that would be later in date, a medieval manor. And no sooner does the trench go in at the bottom of the hill than straight away Phil spots the first find. How did I see that? <laughs> what? Not as wrong as his eyesight, is there? See, you don't, you don't need your hands to do archaeology. Just need your old eyes. That's <laughs> the way. So what we need now is a pottery expert. It's medieval. No, oh, it is medieval. I think it is. When you say medieval in this instance, what, what, yeah. what, what refine that a well, bit more. Somewhere around 1200. Ooh, that would be yeah. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think, think it was good. I didn't think it was to say yeah. that early. Oh, no, 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 it could, could oh, well be. It's yeah. a bit nice, though, yeah. isn't it, eh? It's a great start. We've come straight down on medieval pottery dating to around 1200 AD. So Stuart could be right, and there is a completely unknown medieval manor house here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is, what, what goes on in well, there? Well, it's, it's a bit more degraded in there, but there's definitely the... There's bits of stone coming up. It's not a tall wall, is it? Yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of square. It looks like that squared off piece there fitted in a wall or something. Yes. Matt reckons there's at least one large collapsed building here, but at the moment it's hard to see because of all the rubble. It looks like we might have another building at the other end of the trench. And I'm glad I'm not the one who's got to sort it out. That's a wall. Yeah. Undressed. Yes, absolutely. Unlike all this rough, undressed rubble, this is mm. actually... And that's the uh, only bit of dressed stone yes, we've, we've found. Quite. But could this map, dated 1777, contain a clue to what one of the buildings looked like? And look at the name of the field. Tower Hay. Tower Hay. Yeah. Now, I think that tower field name applies to the fact that there's these big lumps and bumps on the top here. And there was a memory that was a tall building or a stone tower, perhaps an old manor house, but there was a memory of a stone building in this field. Stuart now believes that most of the bigger earthworks are part of the medieval manor house. And this is an exciting discovery in itself. It's possible that these lost medieval buildings could be very early, perhaps even dating back to the period just after the Norman Conquest. And you can see you've got the coast out here with all the mud flats. See all these lines on here, these are medieval strip fields. I, this wasn't flooded in the medieval period because we were able to plough it. But there are areas where you can see stream channels and areas that don't have ploughing on. Could this be where you could bring boats up to our site? 
The theory is that there was a tidal creek, known locally as a pill, running close to our site. It may well have looked something like this one, which is only a couple of miles away. Phil's going to help with the search for the Lost Creek, and he's wondering what the harbour at Port Skewit might have looked like. I've been looking round the sides of this hill for most of today because, quite frankly, the archaeology up here on the top was so complicated, I wanted to give the archaeologists time to have a really good look. The big news is that Matt reckons he's revealed a doorway into one of our medieval buildings. That's lovely, isn't it? This door jam coming yeah, out there. It's just yeah. come up now. Making a nice space for the timber door to fit yeah, into. Yeah, door in there. Yeah. We've got a doorway here into one building, and we've also uncovered two walls that are clearly part of a separate building. And both walls, bizarrely, have been made without using mortar. If you build a good solid stone wall, gravity will actually hold it in place for you. Without having any mortar? Yeah, with no mortar. Oh, until it begins to fall down, uh. because then it seems to have crashed right down the hill, gravity assisting in its collapse. On top of Ian? Yeah. <laughs> Ian's up to his neck in rubble, but he's also finding a lot of medieval roof tile. But underneath this rubble here, we've had this layer of roof tiles, which I think means that the building was actually didn't fall down, it was brought down, demolished. They took the roof off, threw away what they didn't want, and then they took the walls down and threw down all this rubble on top of the roof. It's taking a lot of time, but we're slowly making sense of these medieval buildings. And up in the helicopter, Stuart's ready to report to Mick. He reckons he's worked out where the creek ran up to Port Skewart. The church sits on a little promontory of high ground. Can yeah, you see that? I can see down. the edge of that, yeah. yeah. The low ground, you can trace in a channel out towards that electricity pile. Oh, yes, on. I can see it going across the field. You there. can see the channel to the right carrying yes, on. Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. that's the line of the original creek. Phil's boat at the moment is here, and he's looking from water level at what would once have been the entrance point into the creek. So, literally, everything that's forming the shore now is silted up. Yes, it looks like featureless mud flat, but in fact, that's changed with the new medieval seawall coming in and could have been our pill during the early medieval period. Colin, if you were coming into a harbour here, what can you can you tell me? Would it be a favourable place for harbour? Well, yes. First of all, the tide would have pushed you nearly right up here, having bounced off the English stones, and then the last little bit with the westerly wind as we have now, you would have just sailed straight in, which is exactly what we're doing. And if we go very much further, we're going to be on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> we better turn around and go back. Ready, Mark? <laughs> well, that's great. We've located the long-lost creek that once connected Port Skewart with the Severn Estuary, allowing boats to reach here from places like Bristol, just across in England, and the wider world beyond. But was the creek still flowing when our manor house stood proudly on this hill? The news is that we've got enough pottery now to date these medieval buildings. You've got a good, uh, good idea because the, the pottery is, a lot of it's from Bristol, and it's, uh, it's a type of pottery which doesn't come in until the second half of the 13th century and, and goes out in the 14th. In our trench here at the bottom of the hill, much of the day's been spent investigating this ditch which we can now confirm also belongs to the medieval manor. But it's meant that we haven't had time to investigate the layers Phil pointed out to me this morning. With Roman pottery at the bottom and medieval at the top, we could have a layer of Saxon history in the middle. I've been promised we'll definitely find out tomorrow. Day three here in Port Skewit in South Wales, and our last chance to find evidence of Harold's Saxon hunting lodge thought to have been in this field. What we've learnt so far is that many of the big lumps and bumps here belong to a 13th century manor house, which is causing a lot of excitement at the moment. And there's all this work stone coming, and we found oh, this crikey, lovely work bit there. So we took that out, thinking it was rubble, and underneath, another one the same, and another one the same, all stacked up well, what about the, What about that as well? Oh, oh yeah. There's two more there, look. <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. That's the side of a doorway, I would have thought. Ah, door, the door jam. Well, yes, and you, you've presumably got a stack of them. These stones were part of the door. Slowly, we're starting to build up a picture of what these buildings look like. 
You see, it's oh yes, out. yes. So yes. I guess maybe those or similar stones would have been out, would have been on that. That would make sense, as that's the doorway there, and you're coming into something this way. Yeah. And if you're coming into something, then presumably this earthwork and this parched grass is is the inside of it. Mm. Oh, I just wonder if this isn't the tower that yeah. the field's named after. Well away from the medieval rubble, we're going to have one last stab at finding some earlier structures on this hill. Our last trench is going in here. If we're lucky, this bit of the field might not have been built on in medieval times, and we might come straight down on some Saxon evidence. Oh, that's nice medieval, isn't it? That is nice medieval. That's very nice. What, 13th century, I think? Still early, then. Yeah. There's so much good archaeology here that Phil will be happy whatever we find. But personally, I'll be disappointed if we can't find anything to prove the Saxons were at least here in 1065 AD. I'm told my best chance is in this trench. Here we've exposed a series of layers in the slope of the hill that could allow us to get at any Saxon evidence if it's here. Ooh. So how are you getting on then, Tracy? That's looking interesting. Yeah, it's not what we expected. We were peeling off this redeposited clays forming the terrace yeah. to find the earlier ground surface. And is it coming off easily at that level? It is. It's just peeling off of this. Oh, Good look Lord, at that. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. That is definitely the level, then, isn't it? But what we didn't expect was this yellow degraded sandstone. The top layers, which have now been removed, dated to 1200 AD. They were put down to create a terrace on the side of this hill, and it looks like similar terracing has been going on in much earlier times. Could this be evidence of activity here in the Saxon period? Mick tells me it's rare to find Saxon pottery, but we have to hope for some dating evidence as Tracy carefully unpicks these layers. A worn coin of Harold, I think. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll do my best with But right now we're running out of time. The villagers who invited us here are turning up to see what we've been able to discover about Harold's Field. And in Matt's Trench, we're nearly ready to tell them. We're down deep enough to find the floor of this building. Oh, at last. Excellent. What is it? What, what are they made of? That's stone. Yeah, it's that's sandstone. These are harder. Mm. These are limestone, yeah. Strange thing, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be lower than the, the bottom of the wall there, doesn't it? This is so typical of you, Mick Aston. We're all working away in the freezing wind over in the field, and you're sloping off to the church. We're working away on the church. Rick reckons we can tell the villagers when the manor house was built. This church dates to the early 1100s, and he's noticed it's got similar stonework to this bit which he's lugged across from Matt's trench. Well, I mean, I would suggest that you could put it almost yeah. exactly yeah. into that doorway. It's the same type of stone, even exactly though the, the colour looks stone, different, doesn't it? The same block size, yeah. same detailing. The windows have been added in the early 1200s, and they too are a match for some of our dressed stones, suggesting that our manor house was altered at the same time. So that one, yeah. we're comparing with this one. Yeah, so we can, by comparison with this window, suggests that perhaps in the early 13th century, there's a significant alteration. Yeah to that great tower that Matt's working on. So, Mick, what do you think is the relationship between this church and what we've got over there? I think it's, it's a very direct relationship which you see all over the country, which is the manor house has the church next to it. And, and that's usually because they start out as the private property of the people in the manor house. It's only later they get dragged away and become the parish church. The church and manor house were probably built by the same stonemasons. But can we now say which bits of the manor house we've been digging up? I think what we're looking at here is the doorway into a 12th century tower. I mean, right. it's magnificent. Inside, you've got the floor, and then you go out through the doorway over the threshold. That's that big stone down That's there. That's that big see, slab yeah. there. And then you're outside the building. Yep. And then our trench turns right and goes down the hill. And what the trench has done is, is cut through a range of buildings along that side. Yeah. 
which are later 13th century and I think probably are, are, are likely to be a stable block. They've got a, a central sort of walkway going through. And we've got no later 13th century pottery from there anyway, no. have we? So it, it's not domestic. No, I don't place. think it is. So we know these big earthworks sketched long ago in Harold's field are not the remains of Harold's Saxon hunting tower. And we can now reveal to the villagers what was under the lumps and bumps. The main building we unearthed was a Norman fortified tower house, likely to have been three storeys high. Next to it there was a stable block, and these earthworks are likely to be a courtyard with ancillary buildings set around it. Encircling the hill was this deep ditch, and the impressive route in was across this causeway, with the creek on one side and a large lake of spring water on the other. This was the home of the local lord, but not the centre of power as it was in Harold's day, because in Norman times, their base was at Chepstow Castle down the road. But what I hoped for was something to link this field with Harold. Did we get any pre-conquest pottery? We've got some of the earliest medieval pottery ever found in Wales. Really? Uh, it's very exciting. But is any of it proof that the Saxons were here? We've just got a fragment out now. It could well be you know, pre-Norman, uh, almost certainly, but... Which we'll, bit's that? It's a very small piece there. Oh. Right. It's not too fanciful, then, to say that this could be from the time of King Harold? No, not at all, because we know it's that much earlier in the sequence. Well, it's not much, but finding this from a time when there simply wasn't much pottery feels like discovering the Holy Grail. This is chaff-tempered ware, and it's Saxon. I can hardly believe it. We can tell the locals that we found evidence of activity here just before the Norman Conquest. And for me, it's proof enough that Harold was here. Our historian Sam is convinced that Harold would have built his hunting lodge on this important hill, intending it to stand out as a symbol of new power to anyone arriving in the creek below. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.